Hello, and welcome to The Far Away Nearby, a show about a nerd and an intellectual sharing experience and laughs along the way. Hello, Sue. How are you? Hi, DJ. I'm doing real good. And yourself? I'm doing pretty good. I've had a relaxing time off, which I'll get to in a bit. And uh, we're going to go ahead and start right off with talking about our weeks. What were the highs and low points of your last week? Well, um, the high, the high point um, is that I'm getting better. <laughs> the low point is that I've been depressed for, I don't know, I, perhaps a month. Mm-hmm. I have times that I'm really down and times that I feel much better and am quite sociable and all the things that I'm supposed to be uh, or that society expects you to be. When I feel real pressured about something or I put pressure on myself for some reason, that can just drive me into a really deep depression, mm-hmm. especially if I'm headed that way anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it's really easy for me to get to get there. I don't know why, but the fact that my two grandchildren are both in college and they are both doing some really stupid things that I did when I was a child. When, when I was a child, when I was at university, mm-hmm. and so I am a little, I I am a little confused and a little, and I guess I that makes me very sad and annoyed and and yet it's really it seems like a really bad thing to say to them. You're behaving just like me. It seems kind of weird to say, you know, you're acting just like me. Although I know there are thousands of people in this world that are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I I would assume, and and, and not being somebody who has uh, clinical depression, but having a sister therapist and certainly a niece that has depression, my understanding is that a, probably a good part of what you're going through has to do with the the feeling of being, or possibly a feeling powerless to change that. Well, yeah, uh, I, yeah, I suppose. I don't know. I, no, no one has ever quite explained how my depression works. What I know about right. depression, I have kind of learned myself. I, I have seen therapists a lot in my life, mm-hmm. and then I just stopped because one day I was like. You're not really doing anything for me, you know? Yeah. And I have seen therapists off and on since then, but not extensively like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess that the person that I felt most comfortable with was a uh, psychiatrist I saw in Denver. I saw him like, I don't know, every three or four months maybe. And that was part of when they were trying to diagnose me with the issues that I had that put me on disability. Mm-hmm. Um, he was part of the the people I went to. Okay. Um, and then he and my neurologist argued with each other, and they tried to argue through me, and that really pissed me off. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm going, if you want to talk to these people, call them up and tell them. Otherwise, yeah. I'm going to do what the neurologist says in relation to things that the neurologist has to do. And I'm going to do what the psychiatrist th- has, says in relationship to things of, of that have to do with my psyche. And yeah. that worked really well for me. I don't know how well it worked for them, but it worked much better for me. And my psychiatrist was much better about that mm-hmm. than the neurologist because the neurologist really thought that he ought to step in and talk about the things of, of my mind. And I, I think that just has to do with the hubris of, of doctors. Yeah. <laughs> well, because I'm sure that, um, you know, what would be considered a, 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 uh, a healthy course of action is going to be somewhat the meeting of the minds of the physical cause versus the neuro- neurological cause. And certainly we aren't throughout our lives, your body changes. And mm-hmm. so the chemicals in it change and, you know, you're not going to be able to have the same dosage of something through all of your adult years, or maybe even the same things. Cause I, as I understand it, the medications that are given to people are always effective, and so those have to be changed regularly. Well, it's, it's true, and, and some things are not effective at all. When I was in, 
when I was, I don't know, 22 maybe, the psychiatrist I was, I, I saw through my, I, I saw a psychologist and then occasionally he'd send me to a psychiatrist because he was not allowed to, to write prescriptions, right? And he would send a note and say, this is what I think she ought to take. And usually the psychiatrist who would chat with me for about five minutes and then he would say, okay, because he really didn't care. I think right. <laughs> he was just yeah, as, doing as, his job because that was what he did. That's all he did is he talked to somebody for about five minutes and write a prescription for him and you know them very well. So their psychologist or whoever they were seeing in, in the clinic where I was going were, were uh, probably the best informed about that. And it worked okay for me at that time. I didn't mind it, but, uh, but sometimes they did put me on some very strange stuff. And, of course, when I was – since I think that I started a kind of severe depression when I was, like, seven years old. Mm-hmm. And the first thing that anybody ever gave to me was B vitamins. Oh. Uh, I took vitamin B and vitamin C because mm-hmm. they didn't have much to treat depression at the time. They had right. shock therapy. This would have been, like, in the early 60s. And well, depression yeah, I mean, was he, not really one of those things that they were that they did. They gave adult women uh, Valium for such things, and later on, uh, when I was older, in the late sixties, early seventies, I did take Valium. It was not worth very much, so I tended to give it away to my friends who thought it was a jolly little um, drug trip. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, uh, drugs were all the rage at the time, and, and I didn't see it. it. It didn't do a damn thing for me. I'd take oh. hands full of those things, and they wouldn't do me anything, anything. You know, I, I um, it's been a fair number of years now. I think it was so uh, probably eight or nine years ago now that I had LASIK surgery done, and that's one of the things that they promote when you come for your consultation is that they encourage patients that have any sort of anxiety about the procedure to go ahead and take the Valium that they offer. Mm-hmm. And I've never had Valium before then or since then, but it was quite interesting because, you know, for being the sci-fi nerd that I am, it just yeah. added to the experience because, I mean, <laughs> it was a quick procedure. It was only 15 seconds, but it made it feel like an alien abduction experience. <laughs> <laughs> really they could do that in 15 seconds uh-huh <laughs> did they do both eyes at the they, same time they did and i got a special discount too because i filed bankruptcy halfway through my repayment plan <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible, uh, that, yeah. wasn't, that, that wasn't the intention but you know when, when you go yeah. through those things you get legal advice and they tell you this isn't to pick and choose you have to do all or nothing. It's and true. So, of course, at the time, I just thought to myself, well, I guess I'm not going back for any sort of aftercare. Well, yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> although sometimes they don't have any idea. I know when I went up, when I had my second knee done, or maybe it was my first knee, I, I can't remember, uh, I went I, I went up to see the surgeon and... and um, and I hadn't finished paying off the the shoulder bill, you know. And I said some, no, I think it was I think it was the second knee because that was the shoulder bill and the and the knee because it was over two or three thousand dollars for that kind of surgery. I don't think it was very much, but my last shoulder was much cheaper. It was only about five hundred dollars. Uh, I, so I guess the insurance was better. I don't know. <laughs> the I, I said something to him about it, and he says, I don't care. They Somebody else deals with that. I don't. Right. <laughs> you know, so it, it, might not have, it might not have mattered. He was there to take care of people, and he took care of people. Mm-hmm. And they gave him a salary, and he took it. And, uh, you know, and there was a uh, a billing department that took care of that other stuff, and he didn't was not bothered with right. it. Right. Yeah, it's it's like these uh, big corporations. They don't know where their money comes from. Mm-hmm. But um, just to, to uh, bring it back for a moment to talk about depression, it's interesting because, 
you know, some could argue that while we've in more recent years have made great strides with discoveries of medications and treatments and therapy and whatnot, we can still in some ways be very much in the dark ages. And I just remember as a child growing up in my household, my dad was a stay at home dad and Mm -hmm. he grew up during a generation where women were just starting to go into the workforce. So it was still very much a male ego thing that his wife was the breadwinner and it was decided for him to stay home because she made more money. But I think yeah, that was probably rough too. <laughs> and and I mean, on, just the, the fact that she made more money than he did would right. Make him- and I think on top of that, my dad may have had some underlying history that, was never really delved into because he came from the type of family that didn't really talk about their problems. Mm -hmm. And of course that's very common. It's part, partly a sign of the times he and his brothers and sisters were all placed into foster care because his parents were going through a divorce when they were maybe in middle school. Oh, okay. And, um, you know, the the Department of uh, Child and, and uh, Welfare and Child Welfare and I guess yeah. Social Services didn't exist yet in that state. But um, right. any, anyways, come to find out in later years, I, I learned that there is a history of mental illness in that part of the family. My dad never lived to know it. He knew that his sister had problems and, you know, possibly his mother but I was doing some of the family history and I found a, a very troubling article about a past member of my family who felt that she was a burden to the family because of the sicknesses she had come down with at the time. Mm-hmm. And around the turn of the century when, yeah. you know, medicine was still waiting for the next big discovery, <laughs> this ancestor of mine was so burdened or troubled by the idea that she couldn't be treated and that she was a burden to her family. So while her pregnant daughter was napping, she decided to sneak out of the house and decided to drown herself rather than be a burden to the family. I, I understand that there is a, a established history of it. It's not just something that spontaneously appeared. You know, this, this family member of mine obviously had mental illness back then because, you know, why would you drown yourself when you have a grandchild on the way? Well, probably not, unless the grandchild was being born out of wedlock and a number of other things that may have also contributed to it. Right. So it it may not, I don't know about the status of the granddaughter and or the daughter and the grandchild, but, you know, any of those kind of things. And if money was at all tight and there were a number of depressions in the late 1800s, so I don't know. Uh, so you were saying that the high point of your weeding are starting to get better. Yes, and the low point is obviously that things were bad. Right. <laughs> that I was uh, that I was pretty depressed and have been for quite a while. So, and so I, I'm doing better. Mm-hmm. So my week was rather interesting. Um, it's been a year since Billy and I last went on an adventure. Yes. We went on our trip to Ireland last summer, oh. and I guess maybe we are still paying that off. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there, there wasn't quite another adventure around the corner quite so soon, and we had a number of things that we wanted to get done in the house. So, Billy's actually been at his job longer than I, so he has more vacation time. Yeah. But due to the nature of his job, let's just say he works in retail. He doesn't get to take it during certain times of the year because you know, they have corporate visits or it's, <laughs> you know, the, the, the high holy shopping season. Yeah. So we managed to actually plan out our vacation time for the same week. While it's not the same week as our wedding anniversary, it's close enough. So we just called it, you know. Yeah. Since we weren't going anywhere this year. We decided to make use of that time, so we had a staycation. Yes. And some of the things that we did, we 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 crossed off a few things on our honey do lists. And well, that's good. <laughs> yes, and the most important part of that being, Billy's boss came by, and she 
is she is a mother, a new mother. Uh, this is her second uh-huh. child now, and they've just bought a house. So they are looking to furnish that, and they drove off with a truckload that was just littering my basement, and I couldn't <laughs> be more elated. And how did Billy feel about that? Oh, he, um, well, he arranged it, so <laughs> oh, okay. I guess they, I think that they call that an admission of guilt. Um, <laughs> we we basically are of the opinion of, like, people need to stop dying and leaving us things. Oh, well. Because <laughs> he had two 90, you know, something grandparents that everybody had grown up and moved out of state. So we do have some pretty cool things that are, you know, obviously keepsakes you'd want to hold on to, like mm-hmm. um, some old tools from Victorian times that might have been his great great grandfather's. Oh yeah, you know, since he's the fix it guy, he wouldn't want to get rid of those. Exactly, but the other things are like grandma's kitchen table chairs. And oh, those might have been cool. I like really old stuff. We do yeah. too, but you know, it, it's just a matter of deciding what style is well, ours. Yeah, I I don't mind mixing styles and what have you, and but I certainly I've got a lot of dressers from relatives and people who have died mm-hmm. because I've never paid for anything. I think. Oh no, that's not true. I bought I bought a used couch and. Um, and uh, love seat, a used one. It wasn't mm-hmm. new, actually. It was, and then when I got it home, I decided I was not as as happy with it as I might have been. And I bought the day bed that I use. I am now using as a sofa. And it's also if we have overnight guests, and since we no longer have two bedrooms, we only have one. It mm-hmm. lives in our living room. Uh, but well, in, in our situation, we had at least a couple of dinette sets. And Billy had lived in his own loft apartment before we met. Yeah. So he had his own uh, furniture set. <laughs> and, you know, his ex and he had rented a house together. Uh-huh. So we had all this furniture that was collecting in our house and it was in the basement. And, mm-hmm. you know, we just kept thinking eventually we want to make like a family room or a den down here. But mm-hmm. for now we just keep tripping over old furniture. So, yeah. But yes, Billy's uh, boss was more than happy to take those things off our hands. And I was so excited that I took a picture of the truck in our driveway. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, if, well, you had a bunch of furniture, too. I don't know how much. I do not remember how much of it actually made it out, that made it out to the East Coast from from Denver. But I, I did a fair amount of downsizing from when you and I met. I, I, know, that, I know that you did. And there was this chair that you and uh, your roommate tried to give me. <laughs> and, I, and I'm going, no, we really don't have room for it. And my sister, who happened to be with me on the last truckload of stuff I took out of your house, because there was a lot of stuff that um, Jonathan wanted gone. Mm-hmm. And I don't know that it was all your stuff, but it all went to my house mm-hmm. or to the dump. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I just... I am re- yes. I am related to my mother who was a who was a depression bride. Uh huh. She <laughs> she got married in in towards the end of the depression, and she and she had her first child right uh, right towards the end of the depression. You know, and and so when she she started her household, she was living with her sister in law or her uh, my father's sister. No, it was his brother and his, her wife, uh, his wife. Sorry, don't want to give you ideas that <laughs> that didn't happen in this family <laughs> at that point, at least. But uh, uh, so she started. She started her her life and her married life and living in this little house in Denver, like all mm-hmm. of us in generate to Denver. Uh, and she worked in a Goodwill because that's the only job she could have. Although she or she could find, although she had a university education and a teacher's certificate. And, but that didn't help her much. 
So uh, she worked in a Goodwill when she when she was first married, and my father was hauling coal, which of course was not good for him. Which of course uh, led to some of his issues later on. That was uh, pretty exciting because we've mm-hmm. lived in this house for three and a half years, and now with that furniture gone. Um, we wow, have the house probably doubled in size. <laughs> yes, you know the first thing that happened when that truck pulled away is we ran down to the basement and we shoved what was left into the corner so it looked like we had that much less. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Now, do you have enough to do something? I mean, you were talking about making it like into a family room or. Or something. Yes, and that's the next chapter that we'll be getting to. Hopefully, this fall we'll crack into the great vault that is my garage. And Mm -hmm. I have a goal because I've only been able to use my garage during the winter. The first year we were in this house. (laughs) We we have a grandparents living room set that's in the garage and Billy has some experience with doing upholstery. So yes. he he intends to redo his grandparents' couch. And his grandparents oh, cool. were, uh, you know, good judges of character and they had good taste. They were business people in their community. They ran a grocery store. Yeah. And um, so they had nice things. And they had this very well-made couch that was actually a sectional couch. And I want to say that it was probably made in the 40s. So, you know, when they they still knew how to make things sturdy, I guess. When they were still making it. I don't think it has to do with the new how. I think it has to do with the willingness to to put in that. Mm -hmm. Because we we make things cheap now because it can be done faster and and not cost as much money. And and besides, we're just going to throw it away. Right. Except I'm not really, really into that. Mm-hmm. The the furniture, the sofa and and love seat I bought is really well made. It's just that it's not quite the style that I really like. But it wasn't very expensive, yeah. you know, and I didn't have to move it very far. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> so it was, you know, it was like I I put it in the back of of I think we. have we didn't have a truck, so we put it in the back of the car. I don't know how, but we oh. got a love seat. And we got a love. Seat. Maybe we borrowed a truck. I don't know. We got a love seat, a couch, a file cabinet, a really terrible file cabinet, and a <laughs> and a thing that goes behind the toilet. You know, above the toilet. And oh the yeah, bathroom, like an organizer. Yeah, a little organizer thing. I, I got all of that stuff. It cost me. Oh, and a set of suitcases, and it cost me two hundred and fifty-six dollars. Oh, day, right. <laughs> so, I mean, it was a complete set of suitcases, including, you know, it was like a huge. If they were old, mm-hmm. they didn't have wheels on them, unfortunately, and that I thought was bad. But I bought if they were blue, and I bought them for my youngest granddaughter. I thought, well, maybe she would like them, but she, of course, never had a place to put them, and they were a little just out of out of style Aww. they kind they kind of be tend to be backpack and and uh, and garbage bag movers uh, uh, see. although she did get a suitcase to go to Australia when she went to Australia with the American uh, exchange whatever thing it is that she went to Australia mm-hmm. for and uh, she did get a suitcase for that hmm. when her well, sister uh, went to Europe she used a duffel bag Right. Well, as I say, um, speaking of uh, stuffing things in backs of cars, you and Billy could probably compare notes because we once managed to fit a dishwasher in the back of his old lady car. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what old lady cars are good for. <laughs> yes. You know, we, 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 uh, we did all of our research on pricing and figured out where we could get it best. And we, mm-hmm. we showed up to pick it up. They brought it out in a box and he took it out of the box right there in the parking lot and just stuck it in the back seat. <laughs> well, yeah, you know that box, it had all this garbage in it to, you know, mm-hmm. like it, styrofoam and what have you, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Well, and the terrible thing is... And so when he is, took though, it out of the box, it reduced in size by quite a bit, I'm sure. 
Oh, yeah, but the, the terrible part of that is also that um, the poor young man who worked <laughs> in the warehouse, I don't think he rung it up properly because a week or two later had passed. Of course, we had ordered the, it was one of those deals where you order it online and you pick it up in the store. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, we had done just that, and apparently this young gentleman maybe didn't ring it up right because like a week or two later, we got an email saying, "Are you going to pick up your dishwasher?" Oh no. and you know we could have very easily just let it slide and gotten a free dishwasher out of it but i think somebody might have lost their job yeah i think that would have been bad did you and so you wrote to him and said you already had it yeah we we you know we we gave him a copy of the receipt and said no we bought it we picked it up so But uh, yeah, so that that was the excitement for my week was yeah. that we got a few things done around the house, and I now have a very spacious basement. And yeah. Billy is presently going through childhood memories to see what can be sold off to pay for car repairs that have already been done. <laughs> yeah, you, so he. Yeah. You said something about that, that the two of you are having some issues with. with those, are, those issues have been resolved, but uh, you know now he is going through his collectibles <laughs> and deciding what can be sold off because, you know, even though they may be little keepsakes and whatever, after a time you take a look at them and you're like, well, this isn't really aging all that well. It's plastic and mm-hmm. it's turning color. If I hold on to it for too much longer, I'm not going to be able to sell it even if I want to. So might as well get rid of it now. Does he have things that are worth worth? Money? Well, he has a few things. They're, you know, all little action figures of different TV shows <laughs> and what. And oh, of yeah. course, <laughs> you know, after a time, if you get to going to the thrift stores, you'll find, you know, the quote unquote regulars who you find out are people who have home-based businesses where they collect certain things, but Mm -hmm. they're not not picking those things up for themselves. They're getting them because they know they can sell them online. Yeah. It's funny because you go in, you could tell the people who have a, a passion for it because they want it for themselves. And then the others who are just like, Oh, well, this might be worth something. Yeah. And, you know, there. I can't remember the specifics, but there was an item or two that Billy had his eye on, and he went into the store, and apparently it was a scenario where somebody was maybe kind of a dealer where they, you know, buy in lots, mm-hmm. and it was set aside, but nobody had paid for it. Billy asked the, you know, the lady at the register, and he said, it, it, has anyone paid for this yet? She says, no, they said they were coming back, and I'm just like, oh, well, I guess it's fair game, because most stores have a policy. They don't hold things, you know? Well, yes, that's true. Um, as a matter of fact, you and I went into a store once about a table that I kind of wanted. Mm-hmm. Do you remember that? And they, but they, somebody had actually put money on it, so it was gone. I, don't remember specifically. Was that when I lived in my house? I think you were still in your apartment then. Oh, okay. I think I was in in the uh, Lauren Bacall apartment then. Ah, okay. And there was really? a blonde Swedish table mm-hmm. in this one antique store. Uh huh. That I this really was, wanted. This this was a second shop though, not the Scandinavian place, right? No, it wasn't the Scandinavian place. This was an antique store. Well, they oh, okay. called themselves an antique store. They looked yeah. like a junk store. To me. Gotcha. Because I, I remember, I, I think. Mean, it, it had a lot of nice things in it, but I wouldn't yeah. really call it antiques. I think we also went by that Scandinavian place, too. Okay. So that was my week. And did you have an article or something you wanted to talk about well, this week, Sue? I was going to talk about, I read this really funny book entitled Heads in Beds, and it's about the hospitality industry, uh, hotels, motels, that kind of thing, mostly hotels and high-end motels. It's written by a person called Jacob Tomsky. That is a pseudonym Mm -hmm. because he still works in the industry, and he doesn't want to get into too much trouble because he might. Because he works in the industry. 
and uh, he may need to to go back to some of the places that he referenced in in the book. But it's really funny. Uh, it talks about the things that the hotel staff does um, in order to get tips, the way they manipulate people in order to get tips, uh, and and not necessarily in a bad way, but but mm-hmm. they do you know, sometimes offer to do more things than you need to have done in order to do something for you that uh, that you might want to give them the money for. Uh-huh. Um, and he talks about funny things that happen and interactions between the staff and, uh, and, and just stuff like that. It's sort of an autobiography or, or what have you. It's, it is funny. Um, and I highly recommend it. It's kind of one of those those summertime read things, I think, more than uh, something you might want to sit down in front of the fire in the middle of winter. I don't know. <laughs> it's one so of the beach read things. I, I wouldn't put too much time in it. But, but it is an interesting book. Um, and in the United States, we, we spend, there's a profit of over $127 billion dollars or there's revenue of that every year in the and hotel industry and in the hotel in, is in the, in the lodging industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a lot of money. Yeah. 127, $128 billion. That's, that's quite a bit of money, but, and, but it employs a lot of people, but I don't think a lot of people make the best money. I think this guy ended up making a pretty good salary because he, as he worked in the industry, he 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 got he got promoted a lot, mm-hmm. which of course is a little easier for men than it is for women. Although most of the women, or most of the people who seemed to promote him were women, so <laughs> there obviously are women in in higher positions in the hotel industry. Um, but he has done literally everything from being a bellboy to parking cars to you know that kind of stuff. Um, the concierge or whatever they call it person who tells you about the neat stuff to do around town and things of that nature. So the, this was written based on the author's experience. Yes. He, he, oh. he graduated from college, didn't know what to do. And one of his buddies said, Here, I'm working at this hotel. Come work with me. Hmm. And that's what he did. It's just, it's not like he studied this, but it's, it's interesting. It's funny. Uh, I don't think he had a a um, ghostwriter. I think he writ- wrote the whole thing himself. Although, like I say, the name is is a, a pseudonym. He still works in the industry, but it's really funny. It's a nice little short read, and it's and if you're and like I say, it's kind of one of those summer books where you don't necessarily want to pay a lot of attention to it, but it's funny and and enjoyable and. And it's something that you might want to know about, you know, some of the things that you can avoid when you go <laughs> when you stay at hotels, and some of the things that you might want want to take advantage of. Mm-hmm. That sounds like an interesting book. Certainly, if you need a distraction, you've been thinking about something too much lately, or maybe you always just wondered what goes on behind the scenes. Yeah, it's just it, it is. It is not going to. It's not going to educate you a whole lot. It is interesting. It does tell you a little bit about how hotels work, mm-hmm. and it's mostly hotels. I think he mentions motels a little bit, but but he's talking about the more high end things. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't generally stay at those kind of places. But right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. But, you know. N- nowadays, the Duchess has to report her. Uh, her finances. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, I, I've worked in the hospitality industry before in a call center environment as well as at a front desk for a short amount of time. And some of the things you learn on the job are interesting. Like, um, <laughs> you know, when if you are at a property where maybe you answer the phone and you know this was this was in the late '90s, so certainly it's probably changed quite a bit since. But um, you know, I no, I couldn't quite find a publication date on it. So what I, I mean to say is that um, this was a smaller property that I worked at, and change tends to 
come slower to smaller <laughs> places. So yes. at this point in time, you you know, you answered the main line for the hotel and um, they could ask for a guest, but you know, they a lot of times people will ask what room number someone is in. Yeah. And of course that's a big no no because um, you can only ask for somebody by name and of course if they're registered and checked in they can be connected but you know you never give out the room number i would think not that right then that goes along with when you're at the uh, the hotel desk checked in they're never supposed to speak aloud your room number they're only supposed to write it down and you know mm-hmm. tell you you know this elevator is closest or you know yeah how to get around the hotel. So, okay. Well, um, that brings us into my topic. And as I do from time to time, I found an interesting story on a site for news of the strange and unusual, FARC, F-A-R-K, like kite.com. Mm-hmm. And this article is titled, Fugitive Nearly Evades Police Using Hollywood Quality Disguise. And this story comes just from the Washington Post. And the article says that Sean Shiz Miller was desperate. Police had surrounded his residence in South Yarmouth, Massachusetts, and were demanding that the alleged drug trafficker, a fugitive for months, come outside. Miller did exactly that, but not before slipping on a wrinkled, liver-spotted mask that added about a half century to the 30-year-old's face. It was a criminal Hail Mary, to be sure, and it worked for a time. Upon further investigation, officers determined that the elderly man was in fact Miller, and at that point, officers pulled off Miller's realistic disguise <laughs> and placed him <laughs> under arrest. Miller ah, made- well... <laughs> but his strategy seemed to impress the arresting officers and of course you know they they were saying that this was um in some of the uh promotions of this article they were saying that it was a scooby-doo style story and <laughs> you know what do you remember what what is often said about scooby-doo and uh, not, you know, not really, because although my <laughs> oldest granddaughter was a big Scooby-Doo fan, I never really got into it very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they, you know, they say that a lot of children's programs have hidden lessons in them. Oh, well, yes. <laughs> I, yeah, I know that. And um, they say that the that the thing that uh, Scooby Doo teaches us all is that uh, human beings are often the monster. Yeah. The real monster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's well, interesting is I go on to read more about this article. <laughs> it's funny because, well, or maybe ironic, but um, this seems to have happened in the neck of the woods that my ex was from. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> well, there being a lot of criminality in that area. Yeah. Well, I'll just say this: my ex came from the northeast. It was in New. It was in part of New England, and I will just say this: it is one of those areas that is very beautiful and is a tourist destination. But mm. if, yeah. if you know, if you're if you're having to live there throughout the year, I'm sure that um, you know the job market is repressed because you know in the in the winter months you're not going to be showing people the beach. And, it, um, it's true, um, and I think also that that part of the country is just I, the the Northeast is has had a lot of problems. That they had a lot of manufacturing and stuff, and not so much now. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have moved all of it. that's part of the country where there as you moved all my jobs overseas, right? And, and so I think that it's just really and and nothing much has replaced it. And as in many areas, the tourist touristy stuff does not go on all year round. Yeah, and it's uh-huh. it's it's one of those things where there is a movie which, in its own right, was good, but it's one of those movies where you maybe don't need to see it more than once or twice. Yeah, and it was one with, um, oh, former underwear model. Um, 
That sounds interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Mark Wahlberg. Oh, okay. Yes. And it was even more interesting. (laughs) And and the the movie was called The Perfect Storm. I don't know if you've seen this. Oh, uh, I have seen part of it. I've actually found it kind of boring. Yeah. um, (laughs) I mean, uh, if if you were somebody who came from that part of the country. I'm sure that it would have a certain appeal because it tells the story of many who live there, you know, that, that you yeah. have family that serves on a fishing boat maybe, or in the past that's been part of your family's history. And while the movie itself is very pretty as far as cinematography mm-hmm. and the acting is not bad, it's one of those films where if I were a person who was involved with like the local tourism board or the chamber of commerce, I, I would strongly encourage that people not see that movie. <laughs> Out in the far world. Thank you for listening to The Far Away Nearby. You can find our fan page on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at TFNDJ. This show is available on iTunes. Google Play, and Stitcher Smart Radio. Our email is tfnpodcast at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 720-230-6919. This show is a proud member of the Pride 48 Podcasting Network. Check out other great podcasts at pride48.com slash shows.